Okay, welcome back. Homework's due today and the extra credit. So please pass those forward if you have them. Here's homework 10 going back. <clears throat> And then this is a sheet that we're going to refer to today in the lecture, so just take one and pass it back, and I'll collect all the other homeworks. This is it. Okay, um, before we start on this, I just had a comment on the homework that I noticed, um, a mistake that a lot of students made. Um, it's, not a, it's not a huge mistake, and in this problem it doesn't create significant error. But it's something that I think is um, a fundamental understanding of how this works um, maybe was missing. So when we apply energy conservation to a system or mass conservation to a system, we can apply a mass balance or an energy balance. And the following always holds true that E dot in minus E dot out is equal to the change in energy of the system with time. Okay, that's always true. So is m dot in minus m dot out is equal to the change in the mass of the system with time. What is not true is b dot in minus b dot out does not equal the volumetric change of the system with time. Okay? The only time that this is true is when you have an incompressible substance, so your density is not changing. So that was the assumption that a lot of the students made on one of the problems is that v dot 1 plus v dot 2 is equal to v dot 3. And that was the problem where you had two channels coming in and then one leaving. You can say that the mass flow rates will balance. So m dot 1 plus m dot 2 is equal to m dot 3. But you cannot say that the volumetric flow rates will balance because you're dealing with air, which is not an incompressible substance. So the density of the air changes with temperature. And although it doesn't change significantly, so if you made this assumption that your air is not great, um, it is something you have to be very careful about. So knowing when you can make that assumption and when you cannot. If you're dealing with liquid water, the density generally does not change over whatever uh, temperature interval we're analyzing. But for ideal gases, for air, for any other substance that um, is not pretty consistent and incompressible at whatever state you're analyzing it, you can't make that assumption. Okay, so always go back to energy balance and mass balance and don't, uh, don't jump to this conclusion if you aren't dealing with an incompressible substance. Okay, makes sense? And a lot of people did it. It wasn't a unique um, mistake um, unless somebody's just copying, you know, if there's like the genesis of who did the homework and everyone else copied them. I don't know if that was the case. But um, anyway, now you have been forewarned. Um, so homework 12 will be our last homework assignment of the semester. <laughs> And it will be due the last day of class on Thursday, December 7th. So you have more than a week to do it. Um, it will cover the topics from today, from this Thursday, and from next Tuesday, which are the last three lectures which will contain new material. The lecture on December 7th will be a review of the course, and we'll go over some of um, the big ticket items that you need to remember um, and should have in mind as you go into the final exam. Okay, so one last homework assignment, and then course evaluations are available, and I get a daily email that's like, remind your students to do these course evaluations, and I will continue to get that email until everyone does their course evaluations or until the evaluation period closes. Um, we do look at the evaluations. They are important to us as professors, so provide valuable um, feedback to us. It, you know, it, it needs to be workable or usable feedback, not like, I hate thermodynamics and this class sucks. <laughs> I can't do anything with that. I'm sorry you hate it, but there's nothing I can change to make you like it more, unless I just made it super easy. Um, but if there are certain things that you really liked about the course or really disliked about the course specifically that are things that can be changed, not just content, um, then make those notes and make those remarks in the comments because it will 
be helpful in the future. And then our final exam is two weeks from Thursday. So I hope you are excited and getting ready for that. So today we're talking about renewable energy, and I'm actually really excited for the next few lectures um, because we spend so much time in this class focusing on um, how to make things more efficient when we're dealing with old school fossil fuels and, um, and some of the older um, thermodynamic devices that have been around for centuries. Well, I think it's pretty interesting to also add on to that a discussion of renewable energy and things that can be done differently and how they can fill the gaps and what, uh, what are the barriers to entry in the renewable energy field. So it's, um, it's an exciting topic and hopefully you looked already at chapter 18 online. I'm pulling most of the material out of that, but um, I'm also using some information that's pertinent particularly to West Virginia from the, um, the EIA, which is the energy something something the government website. Okay, so when we talk about West Virginia, it should be no surprise to you that we're in coal country, we have a lot of natural gas resources, um, that we're fourth in the United States for total energy production. That includes um, raw materials, so the natural gas and coal that comes out of the ground and is shipped to other states. It also includes the energy or the power that we produce in state with coal or natural gas power plants. Um, and of that, being fourth in the nation, only 6% comes from renewable energy resources. And that's mostly wind and hydroelectric. We don't have a very um, strong foothold in the solar industry in the state. I know there are some companies that have come in and are trying to change that, but we'll talk about some of the, the problems that arise with that. Um, we're the second largest coal producer in the United States. We're the largest east of the Mississippi, the first largest is in Wyoming. Um, and then nearly half of all the energy resources that we produce are transferred out of state, and many of them are transferred out of country. So, a question that I always have, and me being a transplant to the state, it boggles my mind, that if we have a state that is so rich in resources, why is there so much poverty? Okay, so think about that question as we move forward that we should be one of the richest states in the nation, yet we aren't. So why is that? If we look at um, the U.S. in general, this is the electrical or the electricity generation by fuel type. And you can see that um, in other parts of the country, coal and natural gas, which is our predominant, 94% of our energy comes from coal and natural gas, um, it's a much smaller percentage in other areas of the country. So we are a heavy fossil fuel state. We have the resources in state, so our personal electric bills are lower than they are in a lot of the country. But yet, um, we also have to suffer the ramifications of the environmental pollution that comes along with it. Um, it's pretty interesting, actually, to go to this website um, here, because you can look at the statistics for West Virginia uh, specifically. And there's a map I want to show you. Um, so you can look at um, you can look at a lot of the different statistics for the prices of natural gas, how we rank with other states. Um, if you look at our state here, this is the outline of West Virginia, and all of these little black triangles signify coal resources or um, coal-fired power plants, these little uh, flames are for natural gas. If we zoom out, we can see that there's a lot more in other parts of the country. I don't know why it's doing that. That's too much. <laughs> Zooming too much. Okay. Um, see how we're, we're heavy on the coal and the natural gas in the Appalachians? What do you think all those little yellow dots are? Solar power. And then if we zoom in really close, we do have near Beckley. Where am I? Yeah, going down slowly. Okay, there's Charles. Yeah, keep going down. Okay. So we can see that these are wind turbines. 
So we have some in the Rock Camp Mountains. There's also some in in the Laurel Mountains. But there's a big array of <laughs> Somewhere around here. That is before Beckley. Is it right below your mouse right there? Or is that just gray terrain? This is terrain. There's some outside of Elkins as well. Yeah. Oh, that's what I'm thinking. Outside of Elkins. Okay. It was used to too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the way over here. <laughs> Anyway, you can explore this on your own. Um, go north for Elkins. Yeah. I'm north of Elkins? No, go north. Go north. Go north. Yeah, I've only lived here for 10 years, guys. <laughs> Where's Elkins? There it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, I found it. Okay. So in the Laurel Mountains, there's a huge array of wind turbines. And you can see these. They're amazing to see as you're coming up over the, the ridge line on the freeway that there's a rest stop actually just right here and you can just see them for miles um, and that's it that's really it there's just two major wind um, wind production processes in the state where this is a pretty windy state with a lot of mountaintops um, we prefer to blow them up and get the coal out instead so it will be no surprise that I'm somewhat biased as I go through this presentation but I got a question yes on the left side, what's black liquor? <laughs> is that like beer? We just looked it up. Is it licorice? What is it? It's a waste product. From, oh, it's, from well, the, it's from the fly hash. It's like, yeah, I think it's like sludge. We have a lot of aquatic life that causes a very dark form of color in the water. Is it, isn't that what they have to do with the pigs that they dump bodies in it? Yeah. Like in the cold fields, like that's a big thing. Like if you want to kill somebody, it eats up the body. Oh, how many times have you done this? Yeah. So all of these here are are biomass production processes. So some of the waste that they get from other other processes, like when they're generating lumber or when they're creating coal, there is some waste that can be reused and burned again to create electricity. So I'm not familiar with black liquor, but it sounds like it's pretty nice stuff. Um, so as we continue to use fossil fuels, they're readily available, particularly in our state, for now. But it is not considered a renewable resource. So once the coal is gone, it's gone. Once the natural gas is gone, it's gone. It becomes more and more difficult to get it, more dangerous for those who are mining it. And the process by which they go deep underground to retrieve these resources also brings up a lot of heavy metals and other stuff that then has to be deposited somewhere. So pollution of the environment is a really big problem. I'm I'm sure you remember just a couple of years ago that there was a chemical spill in the Elk River which contaminated the entire water supply of Charleston, West Virginia. Okay, so it's not only just in the processing of coal, but it's in the storage of the resources, it's in the trains that go through the country, it's in all of these different areas that there's significant potential for a disaster. There's a, a pipeline in, in the Dakotas right now that leaves 21 million gallons of crude oil. Um, you can't get that back, and it's pretty difficult to clean up. So it is problematic. Um, it's not something that's going to go away when, overnight, but it's something that we have to consider and think about as we look at our future and our children's future, what kind of country, what kind of planet do we want to leave for them. Um, so the depletion of those resources and the pollution in the environment can be offset by implementing energy efficiency practices. So this means that we'll, we'll use less oil, use less natural gas, so that we're not um, depleting the resources as quickly, and so we're not creating as much pollution. So that's, that's a, an easy one that we can all contribute to. The second is utilizing more renewable sources. Okay, so we'll talk about, um, I think there's five major ones that we talk about in the next three lectures. So it's solar power, wind energy, hydroelectric, biomass, and then there's one more. Geothermal. Um, and these are, are available in varying quantities throughout the country. 
Um, some areas are better suited for certain types of renewable energy than others. So it's important to know and understand more about how we can utilize them, what benefits there are, what are the drawbacks, and, and um, what advantages can come to us by switching over to a more renewable source. So anytime we talk about renewable energy, just a blanket uh, definition in this class is energy sources which are not noticeably depleted with use. So the sun is a renewable energy source, wind is a renewable energy source, um, biomass is a renewable energy source because plants can continue to grow. Things that take millions of years to create, like coal and natural gas deposits, they're not considered renewable because we can't replace them as quickly as we deplete them. So solar energy is the topic today, and this is another map that's from that same um, EIA website which shows um, the incident solar radiation on the United States. And you can guess, probably, that the areas which are darker red are those which receive more sun, and those which are uh, shading towards blue or green receive less sun. So where do we fall in that mix? Green. Okay, we're kind of in the middle. So why are we green? Isn't it sunny here? Okay, so sometimes smog can be a contributing factor, or dust particles in the air. Um, in a way, yes. How much rainfall do we receive in a year? A lot, right? So there's a trade-off with having a lush, green, beautiful place to live and the inability to achieve as much um, solar incident solar radiation. So in desert areas like Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, they have a very, very low rate of precipitation each year, which means that they have very little cloud co cover on, a, on an annual basis. So because we see, receive so much rain, I know it may not seem like it, but there's clouds in our sky a lot more often than there are in some places um, here. And even in places like Florida, which we consider to be a pretty sunny state, because they also receive a lot of afternoon rainstorms. Um, there's a lot more cloud coverage than further west where it's more dry. So advantages and disadvantages to wherever we live. Um, however, it's estimated that if we take 4% of the Earth's deserts, so that would include the deserts in Southern California, New Mexico, Arizona, or possibly in the Middle East, or in Africa, or in some places um, in China, that we would be able to just cover 4% of that surface area and create all of the energy that the Earth needs to use. Okay. So that sounds great, right? Only 4%. Well, it's kind of expensive to do, and there are a lot of um, difficulties with cross-border uh, cross electrical transfer as well. Solar energy can be converted via three mechanisms. And you have witnessed all three of these, though you may never have really known or understand that that's specifically what was happening. But heliochemical is the process of taking this solar radiation and turning it into um, a chemical reaction. So photosynthesis is a good example of that. There are some uh, materials, like if you, um, you've ever seen the paper that you can, you can put things on it, set it outside, and then it changes color everywhere except for where those objects were. Okay, that's a heliochemical process. Um, it's any time you have the solar energy that's being used to achieve a chemical reaction. So the depletion of, um, of like color in a shirt as the sun reacts with it, that's a chemical reaction as well as the solar radiation is bleaching or um, removing color from clothing. Uh, what's interesting to note actually is there are certain fruits and vegetables that have um, like lycopene in them, so carrots, tomatoes, watermelon have all some form of uh, lycopene, and the sun reacts with that and makes the color disappear. So if you ever have like a tomato stain or a watermelon or a carrot stain on any of your clothing, if you put it in the sun, it just like magically disappears. There's a tip for you. Okay, heliothermal is converting solar energy to heat, and it's usually done via solar collectors. So you'll have some reflector panel that will concentrate that heat 
and then you use it either to heat up water or to melt another substance that it's, it's concentrating it into a, a particular area. And then helioelectrical is converting solar energy directly to electrical energy without going through an intermediate heat process. Um, so photovoltaic panels or solar panels are an example of a helioelectrical process. And it's a different mechanism um, <clears throat> to convert solar energy to electrical than it is to just simply collect the solar energy and concentrate it so that you have a higher form or a higher um, quality heat. Uh, solar radiation is our primary source of energy on this planet. And even, in, even if we look at um, any energy process that we experience or look at, uh, we can usually trace it back to the sun. So if we think about fossil fuels, where, well, at one point those were animals and plants that lived on the earth. How did those animals and plants get their energy? From the sun. Um, if we burn a tree, in reality we're burning energy that came from the sun via photosynthesis. Uh, hydroelectric power, if we're using rivers or dams or, or something to generate electricity, we can think about, well, where did that water come from? It fell from the sky. How did it get kicked into the sky? The sun evaporated it and, and took that water up there. So the sun is really um, our major source of energy on this planet, and we use it in a myriad of ways, uh, some more effective than other. So it's essentially, we can consider it to be a nuclear reactor, that it's 40, 40 million Kelvin at the core and 5,800 Kelvin at the outer regions, so pretty hot in the center. <clears throat> and the total solar irradiance, or the solar constant, this is the value that's assumed to be contacting our atmosphere on the planet, and it changes slightly uh, depending on the time of year and your location, is considered to be 1373 watts per meter squared. Um, this is what's hitting our atmosphere. So once it reaches the atmosphere, it is attenuated, which means that the value is decreased because the light particles scatter, uh, they reflect off the ozone layer, or they are transmitted and then absorbed by other things um, in the atmosphere. So whether there be clouds or if there are, <clears throat> is there if there's moisture in the stratosphere, um, then that can absorb some of that light that's, and prevent it from reaching the Earth, which is a positive thing uh, because if we were just being exposed constantly to that amount of solar radiation, we would all burn up. Um, so, although it prevents us achieving, you know, the magnitude of, of solar electricity that we'd like, it also prevents us from being killed. So, when we start talking about collecting this solar radiation, um, we have to understand what happens to it when it hits any kind of a surface. And when we're talking about a surface, this can be actually like a physical solid surface, or it could be a liquid, um, like if it's traveling through a, a cloud layer, which has tiny micro droplets, or if it's um, traveling through, through glass or the atmosphere or um, a gaseous material. So if it strikes any kind of a surface, part of it is absorbed into the surface, part of it is reflected, and then part of it is, or the rest of it, is transmitted through. Some of this uh, incident radiation that is absorbed can also be transmitted through either side. So it can be transmitted back towards the source, or it can be transmitted through, so that you can figure out if you know the fraction of these particular quantities, uh, you can determine how much is actually transmitted through the material. And these values, this tau, which is the transmissivity, delta, or uh, rho, which is the reflectivity, and alpha, which is the absorptivity, are known for given substances and thicknesses. And there's a chart or a table of that in your book. Um, so this incident service, as mentioned before, it absorbs some of that radiation, but it may also emit it back out. So that's uh, something to consider. And if we, uh, if we look at all of the materials in the universe, there's certain materials that approach being a black body, which means that everything that they absorb, they eventually emit back out. So it's a perfect absorber and a perfect emitter. But real substances don't emit everything that they absorb. So the emissivity of a real substance is always between 0 and 1. And again, these values are tabulated in the book. But this ratio of the absorptivity and the emissivity 
tells us some important things about these substances and allows us to choose the right substance for our purposes. So if we're looking for something that can act as a reflector, we would want it to have a low absorptivity to emissivity ratio, meaning we would want most of what it absorbs to be emitted back out, meaning that it reflects it back. Um, and if we want something to be a collector, we would want the emissivity value to be low and the absorption value to be high. So whether we're using it as a collector or a reflector will change our material choices. And we'll talk about kind of those two different um, mechanisms. So the first is a flat plate solar collector. And for this, we want them, we want the system to absorb a lot of that incident radiation. So we want the absorptivity of the materials used to be high, and we want the emissivity to be low because we don't want that incident radiation to be then just cast out. Um, we want it to be used. So uh, flat plate solar collectors are often used to generate or, or heat up water. Um, so in areas that have pretty good year-round sun exposure like Europe or um, places in the Central and South America where they're, they're pretty close to the equator, have um, these solar collectors on their roofs and there's pipes running through them that are used to heat up water. Um, and then that's used to, to uh, provide all the hot water that's needed in the household. Uh, in the U.S., we don't use these very often. There are some places in the south, um, like Arizona, New Mexico, again, places that receive a lot of sun exposure, that they do have these available. Um, they're particularly useful in the wintertime to have hot water in the wintertime, less so in the summertime, because you actually generally want cooler water in the summertime. Um, but again, you can't, you can't be too uh, picky with what you get with solar. Um, so if you want to determine the total incident radiation um, on this and how much is absorbed, then you would multiply tau and alpha, which is the transmissivity and the absorptivity, times the surface area times, times g. And g is how much is being transferred through the atmosphere in, in terms of solar radiation. So this g value will be usually in watts per meter squared. This, alpha, this a value is an area, so it'll be in meters squared. And then these two values are unitless. <coughs> so this is telling you how much your solar collector is absorbing. But some of that will be lost to the atmosphere. And this U value is a convection coefficient that um, will be specified based on the solar collector that, that you choose in the design, um, multiplied by the area. And then this T sub C minus T sub A is the difference between the temperature of the solar collector and the temperature of the ambient air surrounding it. And so the useful amount of, of heat or radiation or energy that we receive from the sun is going to be how much is absorbed minus how much we lose. And then we can come up with a, uh, an efficiency for this collector, which is the useful amount of energy divided by how much is incident on it. And this Q dot incident is equal to A G. So we could also rewrite it in terms of the uh, absorptivity and transmissivity and the convection coefficients of this particular solar collector, solar collector if you wanted to determine its efficiency. Any questions on that? So let's do an example. Solar radiation is incident on a flat plate solar collector at a rate of 880 watts per meter squared. So this is our G value. The product of the transmissivity of the glazing and the absorptivity of the absorber plate is 0.82. So tau alpha is equal to 0.82. The collector has a surface area of 33 meters squared. And it supplies hot water to a facility at a rate of 6.3 liters per minute. So there's water coming into the collector is leaving at 6.3 liters per minute. Cold water enters the collector at 18 degrees Celsius. If the efficiency of the collector is 70%, 
determine the temperature of the hot water provided by the collector. So we're trying to find the temperature at the outlet. So we know the rate at which that water is coming out, the volumetric flow rate, but we don't know what temperature it's coming out. So using all of this information about our solar collector, the, the tau alpha value, the area, its, um, its efficiency, we can determine the temperature of the water coming out. So let's look at that. Okay, so from the previous slide, we can calculate our Q absolute, which we, turns out we don't actually need it in this problem, but it's uh, not T, Q absolute. Q absorbed is tau alpha times A times G. So we have 0 0.82 times 33 meters squared times G, which is H80 watts per meter squared. So we find the amount of heat that is absorbed is 23812 23812.8 watts. Okay, so we don't actually need this in our calculations, but it's interesting to see how much is absorbed. Okay, so we know also from the previous slide that the efficiency of a collector is equal to Q dot useful over Q dot incident, which is the same as Q dot over G A. So we can calculate our Q dot useful is equal to 880 watts per meter squared our G times our A, which is 33 meters squared, multiplied by our efficiency, which is 0 0.70. So we find that the useful energy of this collector is 20328 watts. Okay, so that's when we take how much is absorbed minus how much is lost, that's the amount of energy that's actually being put to use within our solar collector taking into account the absorptivity, the emissivity, and the efficiency of this collector. We're given a volumetric flow rate, 6.3 liters per minute, but we want to convert that to a mass flow rate. So the mass flow rate is equal to the density times the volumetric flow rate. And we can assume that this is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed is the density of water. So we do 1,000 kilograms per, no, 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 meters cubed per kilogram. No, yeah, kilogram per meters cubed, sorry. Multiplied by 6.3 liters per minute, but we need to convert liters to uh, meters cubed. So one meter cubed is equal to 1,000 liters, and one minute is 60 seconds. So we find that our mass flow rate is equal to 0 0.105 kilograms per second. Okay, so we know Q dot and we know the mass flow rate. How do we find how much energy is coming into the water? Energy balance, okay? So the Q dot into the water is equal to M dot times C sub P times T2 minus T1. Which we can then say is also equal to the amount of useful energy that's coming from our solar collector. So when we set those equal to one another, then we can solve for T2 and we find that it's equal to 64.3 degrees Celsius. So we're able to take this water from 18 Celsius to 64.3 Celsius just by having a solar plate collector on the roof, which is a comfortable showering temperature, maybe even a little hot. So then it can be mixed with cooler water to make it the correct temperature for your shower. Okay, so that's a flat plate collector, and that's primarily what those are used for, is to heat up water. Um, 
They are sometimes used as a mechanism for um, heating a home. So you can also have some flat plate collectors that then have a, like a hollow space behind them that air flows through and that hot or warmer air can be then blown into a home. So they can be used for that. But again, um, it's only useful to do that when you have enough sun. And a lot of times in the wintertime, you don't have enough sun to be able to heat your home with it using the flat plate collector. So that's the, the disadvantage of solar is that when you want to add heat to a room, you have less sun to do with it. Okay, so concentrating solar collectors, um, <coughs> rather than relying primarily on being able to absorb the heat, they rely on reflecting it to a receiver. So these are called, um, this is called the concentrator. So the incident solar radiation hits this parabolic shape, and then it reflects it all back to a focal point. So in some cases, it'll be what's called a parabolic trough. So you would have like this whole parabolic trough with a tube or a line running down the center of it at the focal point and all of the energy is being concentrated back onto that tube. So maybe there's water running through that tube, you're heating up the water, in some cases to the point of evaporation so that it can be run through a steam turbine, in other cases just simply to heat the water up to a temperature for some other process. <clears throat> so with a concentrating solar collector, you need to know some information about it. One thing is the concentration factor. So it's the ratio of the aperture area to the receiver area. So this is the aperture, and then this is the receiver. Um, we can also calculate, again, the useful amount of, of energy that's received, which is equal to the heat received by the receiver minus the loss. So again, we have this, uh, this term that takes the area of the aperture multiplied by the incident solar ratio incident solar radiation, and then we multiply it by this um, efficiency factor. So that tells us how much of this incident solar radiation is actually sent to the receiver, and this efficiency ratio is a function of the collector and the receiver itself, and it varies widely, so you would need to know experimentally what your efficiency ratio is. Um, and then again, we're losing some of our heat back to convection with the surrounding air, so that's uh, a similar term to what we saw before. Then we can determine <clears throat> the efficiency of the collector, which will be equal to the amount of useful energy that we receive from it, that is received by the receiver in, uh, minus all the losses, divided by the incident radiation. And again, this is G times A there. So let's look at an example of that with a concentrating collector where we have a concentration factor, CCR of 15, and an optical efficiency of the aperture to receiver process, this N sub AR, is 0.93. The solar insulation, which this word insulation is a shortened version of incident solar radiation, insulation, is 520 watts per meter squared, so that's our G value and the ambient air temperature is 20 degrees C. The heat loss coefficient, this is our U value, is 4 watts per meter squared degrees Celsius. If the collector temperature is 130 degrees Celsius, determine the collector efficiency. So we're trying to find the collector efficiency, which is equal to the efficiency of the aperture <coughs> to receiver process minus U times the temperature of the collector minus the temperature of the ambient air divided by this concentration factor times our incident solar radiation or our solar insulation. So if we plug in all the numbers for that, we have 0 0.93 minus 4 watts per meter squared degrees Celsius. And because this is a delta T, we can use Kelvin or we can use degrees Celsius. But the difference in temperature between the collector and the ambient air is 130 minus 20. Our CR factor is given in the problem. That's pretty straightforward. And our G value is 520 watts per meters squared.
So if we look at this, watts per meter squared, that cancels out. Celsius cancels out. That's good. It's unitless. So we have the efficiency of our collector is going to be 0.8736 or 87.4%. And you'll notice that the efficiency of the collector is always going to be less than the aperture to receiver process efficiency because we subtract off these losses. The only time that it wouldn't be less is if it were exactly the same, which the ways that that could happen is if our air temperature is the same as our collector temperature, or if this coefficient is so small that we've somehow reduced the ability of this device to have convective transfer, heat transfer with the air surrounding, um, then you would have a collector efficiency that's the same as your aperture to receiver efficiency. Any questions on that? These particular problems are pretty easy um, because these values, like the CR value and the aperture value, they have to be given to you. The, uh, there's no way to calculate them really because it's so dependent on the shape of your collector receiver and um, the materials that are used, the focal point, um, so it's, it's a value that either has to be experimentally determined by you or needs to be given. Okay, um, so as I mentioned before, there's sometimes a parabolic trough solar collectors and this is, um, this is an image of a uh, it's a solar installation that's in the Mojave Desert, and there's actually nine similar plants. This, this company, SEGS, has nine different plants. Um, and collectively, they create 354 megawatts. That's the net value, so subtracting off whatever they use to uh, power their own operations in-house, it's um, 354 megawatts. So it's enough to power 232,500 homes, which is pretty significant. Yes. How does that relate to like a standard coal power plant? Um, in production, yeah, just it's, it's lower. And particularly per square meter of space that it's taking up, it is lower. Yeah. But emissions are less. I was just wondering proportionally. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the cost, and I think this is in a later slide, the cost of production um, is much higher for renewable energy sources than it is for for natural gas and fossil fuels, only considering um, the, the creation or the production of the plant itself, you know, how to, to build it, construct it, and operate it, maintain it, um, and then the amount of area that it takes up. It doesn't take into account when they give these values environmental impact. So perhaps it's much less expensive to operate a coal-fired plant, but years later down the road when it's a super fun site and it's billions of dollars to reclaim you know, those costs aren't factored in. Um, okay, so if we wanted to um, calculate the thermal efficiency of any kind of a solar operation, it would just be the amount of energy that we um, are able to get out of it after the entire process. So in this case, if we had these parabolic troughs that are evaporating the steam and then we run the steam through a turbine, similar to what we've seen before with a coal-fired power plant, Again, we're just using this as the heat source. Um, so we would have some network out from this, this plant itself, and then we would divide it through by the collection area, which is pretty large, and the incident solar radiation. So we would see how much energy we're collecting from the sun, and then um, use that in the denominator of this thermal efficiency equation. And spoiler alert, thermal efficiencies for renewable energy sources are extremely low, even more so than, um, than fossil fuels. So on the order of like 6%, 3%, that's fairly normal. Because the solar energy that we receive from the sun is in a very uh, low quality form as it hits the earth. So as the sun itself, it's very high quality. If we could just somehow tap into the sun and use it directly, we would have abundant energy supply um, in a very high quality form, but because of attenuation and scattering and reflection, once it reaches the Earth, we have to use a very large surface area to achieve um, our desired results. So, um, Another example of solar collectors are solar power towers, and I showed an example of this in the first semester of thermodynamics, but these are a similar idea 
um, to the solar collectors, but it's like a whole array of solar collectors, and all of them are directing whatever light they receive at that uh, the peak of this tower. And in most cases, this will have uh, a bank of salt in it, so like a solid block of salt in the morning, and it just spends all day melting that salt. And then the heat that, uh, because salt has very high thermal capacity, takes a lot of energy to melt it. It also takes a lot of energy to re-solidify it. So it has a lot of energy to, um, to lend to a thermal process. So it, it's not like water where you can, you can evaporate and condense it without using significant amount of energy. Um, with the salt, it takes a lot of energy to melt it. So we have this huge array of solar collectors that are focusing on that. And then once that salt is molten, overnight it will be re-solidifying once the sun goes down and the energy of that salt block will be then put into um, some other process. So in many cases it's used to create steam and then run a steam turbine. Um, that's usually what they do actually. Um, and again, the cost of these plants, yeah, so it's about five to ten times higher than equivalent fossil fuel plants, um, which means that you're price of the electricity that you generate from these plants is going to be higher. So that path, that cost is passed on to the consumer, um, but those costs are decreasing every year, every decade. That is, they have improved their technology, as they've found ways to produce it um, cheaper, using new materials, more lightweight materials, found better ways to align and clean these solar collectors, because as you can imagine, if uh, there's a dust storm and it covers all of the solar collectors that it's going to significantly reduce the amount of uh, sun that you collect. <clears throat> so they found better, more innovative ways to do all of this, um, that those costs are decreasing. But it will never be on par with the cost of fossil fuels unless we consider all of the other aspects of it. So if there's an opportunity cost to the negative aspects of using fossil fuels, then they start uh, approaching parity. But for now, they're much more expensive. So there's a huge barrier to entry, that these plants are very expensive to, uh, to make, expensive to maintain. They require a large amount of surface area, much bigger footprint than you would find uh, for a fossil fuel plant. But uh, there are envir environmental advantages, and they are completely renewable. Um, solar ponds are also another way uh, that we can collect solar energy. So it's usually a body of water that's man-made, and they're often lined with something that has a very high thermal absorptivity. So <clears throat> as this, the incident solar radiation hits the water, some of, it's, some of the energy or some of the heat is absorbed by the water, and when there's um, a high emissivity material, then uh, it, it helps keep that heat, or high absorptivity material, it helps keep that heat within the water body. And what's kind of interesting with solar ponds, what usually happens is that this top layer, this top surface is, um, is convecting heat to the environment. So if the temperature of the air surrounding the solar pond is lower, then some of the heat of the pond will be um, shed to the environment. So that makes the water at the top surface a lower temperature than the water at the bottom surface. So when they use these solar ponds, generally they're stratified. Um, and because uh, the way that they are designed and the materials that are chosen to line it, um, that it is possible to have hot, hotter layers down low, um, or a hotter, a warmer temperature down lower and a cooler temperature above, which we would normally think would be the opposite, right, because heat rises. Well, it does rise, but it continues to be heated by the sun as it's convected at the surface. So. We can use this solar pond as uh, a heat exchanger or a heat engine because we have a T sub L and a T sub H. So we can use a, a boiler, a pump, a turbine, and a condenser um, in between those two temperature gradients. Because any time we have a temperature difference, we can put a heat engine between those two temperatures and create energy. Um, and so solar ponds are very easy, inexpensive, cheap way to create energy. Um, it, but they have very low thermal efficiencies, and they don't create a lot of energy. So it requires a lot of solar ponds to do anything really effective. Um, <clears throat> but again, that's where conservation 
or reducing our energy footprint come into play. Because there's no way that our country will ever be able to switch over to renewables with as much energy as we consume. Um, you know, you probably know people that have like a TV on in every room of their house and their stereo is blaring and their thermostats turn up to 80 degrees and um, that's just not really sustainable in the long term. That if we ever want to um, reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, it requires a change in how we use energy as well. In addition to increasing the efficiencies of uh, the devices and, and technology that we use, we have to change our own behavior um, so that we can be better. Okay, so thus far we've used the sun. Um, we looked at, just very briefly, heliochemical processes and heliothermal processes. Now we're going to look at these helioelectrical processes. And the most common um, is just photovoltaic panels. So if you think about a solar panel, that's what it is. It's converting that, um, <clears throat> that solar energy directly to electrical energy. And the way that it does it is there's two dissimilar, <clears throat> two dissimilar semiconductor materials that are layered. And um, the way that they react to that incident solar radiation causes a charge to move across these materials. Um, and so once we get charge flowing, we're able to generate electricity. Um, and usually, we have a solar cell, cell, which has all of these different layered or stratified um, semiconductor materials within it. And then each cell is put into an array with these, um, into a panel, which is called a module. So a module will maybe have like uh, 30 or 40 or 50 cells within it. And then those modules will put, be put together in an array. So each individual solar panel can be put into an array um, because one cell individually is not going to generate or create a lot of electricity. But as you add them together and put them in, um, in parallel with one another, then it's possible to create significant amounts of electricity, at least enough to charge a battery or power a home. Um, there's examples of little miniature solar powered devices um, that you've probably seen or had in your home, like the solar powered calculators, there's like solar powered dancing flowers, sometimes people have dashboards, the solar powered lights, uh, landscaping lights that people have outside. So those, um, those are evidence that photovoltaics are becoming less and less expensive. I mean, you can go to the dollar store and buy a landscaping light that receives energy from the sun and then provides light at night. Um, that's not something you could have found 20 years ago, whereas they're pretty uh, abundant now. So photovoltaics get um, a little bit complicated when we're analyzing the, uh, the electrical components of it. Um, because there's a lot of terms involved and the process by which these semiconductors convert solar energy into electrical energy um, is a whole different class. So <clears throat> we'll just look through um, the equations. Uh, so we have some terms that we need to define. One is J sub R, which is the light induced recombinant recombination current. So this is the um, this is the evidence of the helioelectrical process. So when we have these semiconductors that are creating uh, a charge and then a current flows, that's this J sub R. J sub zero is the reverse saturation current. And then this E sub zero and K are constants. Um, and this is in the SI units. If we're working in English units, we have to convert them um, or convert all of the other things in our equation back to uh, in terms of joules. Um, but E sub zero is the charge of one electron, and K is Boltzmann's constant. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, uh, it's joules, its units are joules per Kelvin, or energy per temperature, and so it allows us to determine how, um, how energy is created as the temperature of the cell is changing, and this, uh, this E sub zero gives us an indication of how energy is generated as current is, um, is brought about due to this light-induced process. So it's a little bit complicated. But, um, and then T is just the temperature of the cell. Because although, although these photovoltaic panels are primarily 
a helio-electrical process. There's also a heliothermal process that occurs as well because the semiconductors are generally a darker color and they're absorbing some heat. So they will, they will take advantage of that fact um, and also use some of that thermal energy to convert to electrical energy as well. Um, J sub J is the junction current density. So if we look, where's that picture? This one. Yeah, so J sub J is this junction current. And then J sub L is the load current density. So that's J sub L. And then J sub S is the current output density. So that's what's coming out of the cell. So there's a couple of different currents that we have to look at and analyze because this is, uh, so this is like a model of, of this at the junction between those two different uh, semiconductor materials. There's a current flowing through. Okay, and then there's something called the open circuit voltage where if we assume that our J sub L is equal to zero, um, then we determine what that voltage would be when it's an open circuit. We don't have that J sub L where there's no load on it. Okay, so then ultimately we want to find our net power output. So that's just equal to this load current times the volts times the amps. Um, and then we can figure out what our maximum current would be by taking the um, derivative of this equation and setting it equal to zero. So we find that our W dot max is equal to that equation. Then we can determine our, um, well, these are separate. We can determine our cell efficiency or the efficiency of each individual um, photovoltaic cell is equal to the amount of power that it's able to output divided by, again, this A times G term. So the area of the cell multiplied by the solar radiation that's incident upon it. And then, again, we can look at the max cell efficiency. So if we're able to determine what our voltage will be when, uh, we, when we achieve the max power output, we can put that into this equation and figure out what the cell conversion efficiency is at that point, at that maximum point. And that's, um, that's best done um, using finding this Vmax term is actually best done using the solver. And we'll do an example um, in this problem here. <clears throat> so there's a solar cell with an open circuit voltage of 0 0.55 volts, so that's VOC, with a reverse saturation current density, J sub 0, is equal to 1.9 times 10 to the minus 9 amps per meter squared for a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, so that's the cell temperature. Determine the current output density, J sub S, the load voltage at which the power output is the maximum, and the maximum power output of the cell for unit of cell area. Okay, a note on this, in your textbook, it's the online uh, chapter 18, they have the, the K and E naught values, so the Boltzmann constant and the, I forget what the other one's called, uh, electron something. So this is 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23. They have it as 10 to the 23, which is not correct. And the same for this E is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per volt. So it's wrong. I don't know why it's wrong in the textbook, but um, I don't think they proved that chapter very well because there's a lot of mistakes in it, actually. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is determine the current output density. So we have an equation for our open circuit voltage, which is equal to K times T over E naught times the natural log of J sub S over J sub zero plus one. We can take the uh, exponential of both sides. So if we move this term over, take the exponential, we can solve for J sub S is equal to j sub 0 times exponential of e naught times the open circuit voltage times k times t minus 1. So if we put in all the numbers for that, so j sub 0 is 1.9 times 10 to the minus 9, e sub 0 is given, k is given, our open circuit voltage is given, our temperature is given. We double check all the units, make sure that they match up. 
we find that J sub S is 3.676 amps per meter squared. So that's part A. For part B, the load voltage at which the power output is the maximum, we have an equation for that for the exponential of E naught times V max over KT is equal to 1 plus J sub S over J naught over 1 plus E naught V max over KT. So we see Vmax on this side of the equation, Vmax on this side of the equation. Here it's inside the exponential, here it's outside the exponential. So there's no real good way to solve for it explicitly. Uh, which means that we can use Excel or some other solver program. Um, and I can just... So if you set up a file, and this may not already have, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the solver adding. Okay, so if you set up a file, you put in your E naught values, K values, T, J sub S, J sub zero, and then just some value for V max, um, and you need to approximate it, um, like around 0 0.5, 0 0.4, or something like that. Then you can set up two equations. So this is the first half of the equation, where it's the exponential times E naught V max over KT, because this is E naught V max over KT. And then this part of the equation is the second half, 1 plus JS over J naught over 1 plus E naught V max over KT. Then you take these and you find the absolute value of the difference between the two of them in another square. And this is what you use in your solver equation. So in this, um, let's see, so you think you have to go to File, Options, Add-ins, Solver Add-in, Go, you want to add it in. You guys already know how to do this. Or is it new to anybody? So then now when I look at my data panel, I see this solver. So I can say I want to set my objective, which is this square here, this field, this cell, equal to a minimum by changing this Vmax variable. So I'm solving for Vmax by setting this equal to, I don't want to set it equal to zero necessarily. I want it to be minimized. Um, and if I take the absolute value of that equation, then it minimizes it gets it closer and closer to zero, because if you constrain it to have to be zero, then sometimes it won't work. So then it solves it. I say, okay. So it changed this value of Vmax to be 0.4737, which is the answer for this problem. Um, by taking these two, the difference between those two, and getting it as close to zero as possible. So that's basically how you do it. Solver is equal to 0 0.4737. Um, then we can use that into put it into our equation for W dot max over A is equal to V max times J S minus J naught divided by one plus K T over E not V max. So then we find this maximum power per unit cell area is equal to 1.652 watts per meter squared. 
So you do have one homework problem where you um, analyze these photovoltaic panels, and it's similar to this, but different. You're, you're solving for a couple of different things. Um, so being able to recognize and manipulate these equations is important. OK, so we talked about um, using this, this incident solar radiation or, or insulation in, <clears throat> in an active way. So we take it and we use it and we create energy with it, either thermal energy or electrical energy. Um, but there's also passive solar applications. And passive solar, by and large, is trying to reduce the amount of solar radiation that comes into your home, or it's uh, absorbing that solar radiation and in the winter time and allowing it to um, passively heat your home without going through any kind of like a mechanical process in order to do it. So there's something called a Trump wall, different from a Trump wall, that um, allows uh, the absorption of solar rays. So it's something usually made out of um, like masonry or a dark colored adobe. They use these a lot actually in the Southwest. Um, so it's on the south side of the home, and it can absorb and store heat during the winter months because the angle of the sun is a lot lower in the winter months than it is in the summertime. So they have these homes that are designed, they'll have overhangs and walls and windows so that in the wintertime the sun comes in directly and heats up this wall, and then that wall can just um, release heat during the nighttime hours when it's a little bit cooler. Um, and then in the summertime, because the sun is more directly overhead, the overhangs prevent the sun from hitting that wall so that it doesn't have that same effect. And instead, the wall will have a cooling effect because it will absorb um, or it will release heat during the nighttime and remain cooler during the day. So proper design um, is important. So if you're ever building a home, if you're ever uh, going through that process, knowing how and, and why to orient your windows in certain directions is important. So it's nice to have a perfect, beautiful view. But if your view faces west and you have a whole bank of windows on the front of your house, that's going to be pretty warm, right? So like the engineering building next door, it gets stifling hot in that corridor in the summer months. It's nice in the winter when that sun's kind of beating in, but it was not properly designed for energy efficiency. Um, so orienting construction is important, and there are, um, there are a lot of applications that allow you to calculate in different times of the year based on your latitude what kind of solar radiation you can expect facing different directions. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting and one of your homework problems has you do that. Um, so choosing windows that are higher energy efficiency windows can be helpful. So sometimes there's films that are, that are applied. So like these windows here in this building, um, it is supposed to be more energy efficient. So it has these shades that are drawn, but it also has um, tinting on all the windows that prevents um, some of that incident solar radiation from heating up um, too much. So you can prevent that solar radiation from coming in by pulling shades or drawing blinds. Um, and then you can allow it to come in in the winter months by opening those shades and taking advantage of that solar radiation to, to heat your home. And again, window design, air, overhang design is important. Um, our house is oriented kind of on a north east-west axis. So in the summer months, the sun goes right over the peak of the roof. But in the winter months, it comes along the south side of the house. And we have lots of windows on the south side of our house um, so that the sun can come in. And it's kind of nice. So there's something called a solar heat gain coefficient, which is used to calculate how much incident solar radiation is, um, is absorbed into your home and can be used um, either to analyze how much heat is coming in that is unwanted or to see how much gain you can expect or appreciate to augment your heating in the wintertime. Um, and this solar heat gain coefficient is often uh, tabulated or, or given in terms of the shading coefficient or how much it blocks the sun. Um, and this is uh, related to the solar heat gain co coefficient by, those, by that number. So we'll just do a really quick example in the next few minutes. Um, so that chart that came around. Uh, consider a building in New York at 40 degrees north latitude that has 76 meters squared of window area on its south wall. Um, 
The windows are double pane heat absorbing type and are equipped with light colored Venetian lines with the shading coefficient of 0 0.30. Determine the total solar heat gain of the building through the south windows at solar noon in April. Okay, so that chart is for all, um, is for 40 degrees north latitude, so any uh, city that lies about the 40 degree north latitude line will have the same results. Um, so if you look on that chart, there's two sides of it. One side has uh, times, I think it's not that size, but the other side. Yeah. So if you look, it says noon or 12 o'clock on one, noon and 12 o'clock. And it, they told us that we're in April. So if we go to noon in April and look at the south wall, what is the value of the solar radiation that, that's incident on the south wall at noon in April? 559. Yeah, it's 559. So you need to know um, several different things. You need to know what direction the window faces. You need to know what time of day. You need to know what month of the year because those values will change as you can see according to that chart. And there would be similar charts for all different latitudes. Um, longitude doesn't matter, but the latitude does change. Okay. So, back to the example, that if we want to calculate our solar heat gain coefficient, it's just 0 0.87 times this SC value of 0 0.3. So that's 0 0.261. So our Q dot is equal to our solar heat gain coefficient times the area through which it comes, so the window area times this incident solar radiation, which we look up in the chart. So in this case, it's 0 0.261 multiplied by the area, which is 76 meters squared, multiplied by that number we looked up, which was 559 watts per meter squared. So we find that the amount of heat coming in through the windows with the blinds is 11088.3 watts. Then if the blinds are up, we can calculate the solar heat gain coefficient. And for this, we need to look in table 18-6 for just a plain window. So a double pane heat absorbing window has a solar heat, uh, solar uh, no, shading coefficient of 0 0.58 multiplied by 0 0.87 to convert it to a solar heat gain coefficient gives us 0 0.5046. So the amount of radiation that comes into this, um, this building, if we have the blinds up, is equal to 0 0.5046 times 76 meters squared. And it's the same 559 watts per meter squared because it's the same time of year. So it's 21437.43 watts. So it's almost double what it would be if we had the blinds closed. Okay, so now you're armed with more information um, to help you make better choices in your own homes and if you're designing a home. Um, these are things that are 